Great. So, I'm here to talk about how to acquire your first million users. And in particular, I'm going to talk about the relationship between your company's business model and the digital marketing channels that are available to you. So I practiced law for a little while, and I suppose in keeping with that role, I'm going to be making an argument here. So my thesis is this. Your company's success in digital marketing is primarily determined not by your skill in digital marketing, but rather by your business model. Digital marketing is a business model competition. And the better and more competitive your revenue model, the more marketing channels that will be available to you, and the faster you'll be able to get to a million users and beyond. So let's see. There we go. Uh, by way of quick background, I graduated from uh, Yale College in 2005, and I then went back for law school, and graduated there in 2009. And I had no experience or background in marketing or tech at all. Had you told me five years ago that this is what I'd be doing today, I would have said you were crazy. Um, we started Thumbtack while I was in law school at Yale. And there are two Yaleys in this photo. Jonathan on the right is also one of the founders, and he and I were good buddies on the club soccer team in undergrad. We met Marco, who's in the center of the picture, after we graduated, and we knew we wanted to start something big. We brainstormed opportunities, and we landed on Thumbtack. So, what is Thumbtack? Thumbtack helps you hire professionals to accomplish personal projects that are central to your life. For example, you can use Thumbtack to remodel your home, plan your wedding, learn guitar, <coughs> We've raised a bunch of money from VCs over time. We're a team of 500 in the US and abroad, and we have about as many paying businesses that use our service as Yelp or Angie's List. And I've led much of our online marketing over time, which has resulted in half a million business reg uh, registrations without using one salesperson, and about 20 million consumer visitors over the last year. This year, we'll send about $1.8 billion in business to the professionals in our network. I think we're now the biggest website where Americans hire a few different types of services, like DJs, personal trainers, photographers, and dog trainers, for example. So how do we acquire our first million users? Well, let me first say how we did not acquire our first million users. We did not have a Field of Dreams app. So what is a Field of Dreams app? A Field of Dreams app is a site or service that was built and they came. You know these products. These are products that market themselves. For example, if your product involves 14-year-olds sexing each other with messages that disappear, it might go viral and market itself. If you can build such a product, that's amazing for you, but most mere mortal product products require you to do the marketing and don't do the marketing for you. So we were not Facebook, we were not Twitter, and no, we were not Snapchat. We built it, and they did not come. <laughs> Instead, our marketing was a true labor of love. That is, we had to build everything from scratch with dozens of 10% optimizations over the course of years. So if, like us, you have a consumer service and it is not a Field of Dreams apps app, what do you do? Well, the first question you need to ask is, do you have a revenue model? The types of marketing that are available to you fall into one of two categories depending on your answer to that question. <coughs> if your answer is no, the types of marketing that are, avail that are available to you are things like scrappy things, SEO, or search engine optimization, which is the art and science of making your website appear at the top of Google's search results, or content marketing. If you do have a revenue model, then there are other channels, channels that become available to you. Things like SEM, or search engine marketing, which is AdWords, Facebook ads, display ads, mobile downloads, branded or offline ads. Another way to say this is your revenue model determines the marketing channels that are available to you. 
Broadly said, if you do not have a revenue model, you're forced into the channels on the left. If you do have a revenue model, you can start dipping your toes into the channels on, your, on the right. And on an even more granular level, the competitiveness of your business model versus others in the space will determine the breadth and depth of your success across the wide variety of these channels. So I'm gonna be talking about three revenue models. The first is free or no revenue model. This describes the revenue model of many, even most consumer tech startups on day one. Then there's good revenue models. I put revenue models here with the pricing is crude and unoptimized. At least you have a revenue model. In most V1 revenue models where the company hasn't yet focused on price optimization fall into this bucket. Then there are great revenue models. These are typically highly optimized pay per transaction or commission based models. Imagine big e-commerce companies, Uber, Airbnb, a lot of the paid mobile app install world, paper lead models in the lead gen space. And at Thumbtack, we've gone through each of these three revenue models, or we've at least gone a little bit beyond number two, and the marketing channels available to us were different at each stage. So I'm gonna be talking about each of these three stages. First stage is free. This described our revenue model on day one and even described our revenue model 18 months after we started. But after 18 months, something had happened we'd acquired 130,000 businesses who were using our site and we had no money uh, to do it. So how did we do that? Well, we did that by doing scrappy things. So what are scrappy things? Those are things that bigger companies with revenue models don't focus on. Unless you have a business model, you must be doing something that nobody else is doing. Otherwise, you won't win. You can compete either with dollars or with information asymmetry. And since you have no dollars at this stage, your only weapon is information asymmetry. So what did we do? Well, we have a two-sided marketplace and we need to sign up both the supply and the demand side. And we went first after the supply side. And we used cheap or free online marketing methods to acquire pros at scale. And none of the bigger legacy players in our industry have done this. Why? I think basically because they've had solid revenue models for a long time and so could rely on more traditional methods to sign up businesses, like sales. We figured out how to do it using online marketing and we did it at scale. And I'm not gonna go into too many details, we still use lots of these things, but one clue I'll give is that we've been extremely creative over the years in building an enormous team in the Philippines through Odesk. Today that team is 400 people. So for every one person working full-time in SF, we have 10 people working full-time in the Philippines. We literally feel like we've 10x our capabilities by building this team abroad. And the team has enabled us to do lots and lots of manual things at scale that other companies can't even conceive is possible because it just takes so much human labor to do it. This team is much of our competitive advantage and Thumbtack wouldn't exist without them. So we spent about a year figuring out scrappy things like how to scale Odesk like crazy. They grew the supply side of our business. Then we turn to SEO. So let's talk about SEO. I think SEO is a deeply underappreciated kingmaker in Silicon Valley, particularly among first time young entrepreneurs. In industries where consumers are available via SEO, SEO builds winners. In these industries, those startups that nail SEO win, and those startups that disregard it do so at their peril. If you wonder how a startup has achieved slow, steady growth in its product outside of the Silicon Valley bubble, the answer is probably they focused on SEO. And if you wonder why a startup got lots of buzz on TechCrunch but never really took off, the answer is oftentimes they didn't focus on SEO. Many companies became who they are in large part due to SEO. Mint, Goodreads, Amazon, eBay, TripAdvisor, House. The list goes on and on. Even today, Yelp still gets 75% of its traffic from SEO. None of these companies really started until they focused on SEO in earnest. So in our case, after we finished our scrappy phase, we spent 18 months building our site for SEO. During those 18 months, we focused painstakingly 
on the three pillars of a good SEO strategy, which are first, building a site architecture that's easily readable by Google. Second, building lots of content that's unique to your website and useful to your website's visitors. And third, getting credentialized by the internet community by acquiring lots of links that point to your website from reputable sites around the web. This was a huge bet. SEO was a long-term play, and we spent at least six months working on SEO without seeing any results. But it's a bet that paid off handsomely. Is it my life goal to optimize websites for search engines? No. Do we want to be an SEO company? No. But SEO buys us the time and money to at least have a shot at building a world-class global consumer brand. Last thing I'll talk about in this bucket is content marketing. I'd include content marketing here as well. The last panelist touched on it. Content marketing is the art and science of producing and promoting content, like articles or blog posts or anything that involves writing something that you want others to read, with the goal of building awareness about your product or service so that maybe one day people buy it or use it. The question I'd ask here for your company is, is content marketing real? That is, can it really deliver the growth needed to build a huge business? When your revenue model is free, I'd argue that content marketing really needs to serve SEO purposes in order to make a huge business impact. One-off viral blog posts, or even in 99% of the cases, good PR, aren't going to build a business. Producing content at scale for SEO purposes might help you build a business. And one company I'll give a shout out to here is Zillow. Zillow has built a very well-known brand largely on the back of its content marketing strategy. They have proprietary housing price data, and they've leveraged that data to get in front of the public and policymakers at enormous scale. Last fall, they hosted a roundtable with President Obama on housing policy. That was the result of an extremely well-executed content marketing strategy at scale over a lengthy period of time. In our case, we've done similar things, but at a much lesser scale than they've done. For example, we produce surveys of the small businesses on our site that have gotten our company thousands of press mentions from news outlets, governors and politicians, and public policy organizations over time. We did this basically as a high-end link building strategy, but it's had very nice spillover branding effects as well. This cost us very little money to execute, other than our time and salary costs. So those are the things that fall into the free bucket. Next are things that fall into the good but not great bucket. So if you fall into this bucket, you can start dipping your toes into paid marketing. What do I mean when I say a good but not great business model? I mean that you have a revenue model but it's unoptimized. So you're leaving money on the table by not price differentiating among customers as well as you possibly could. And I'm gonna talk about an example specific to our business in order to illustrate this. Our initial revenue model was free. Businesses paid to join, they didn't have to pay anything to, to get introduced to customers. After this, our first model was a subscription model. So businesses could join our site for free and then pay a monthly subscription to respond to as many customers as we introduced them to. This worked quite nicely for a little while. We built the systems we needed to test paid marketing, and we saw that there was significant opportunity for us in many of them. We made good money at the beginning. But we ran into a wall. So imagine we made $50 in revenue per month per subscription. Under that, map, under that model, we could make a profit so long as our monthly cost for that subscriber rate remained under $50. However, as soon as our total costs, including our marketing costs, reached $50 a month, we started losing money on that subscriber. The higher our advertising costs rose under a sub subscription plan, the less profit we made. The more we marketed, the less money we made. No matter how good our digital marketing team was, they ran up against the wall because our business model was only good and not great. So that's what I mean when I say that having a good business model can be good for a while, but it only takes you so far. Our good business model allowed us to test paid marketing channels, but not scale. And I'm guessing that you can imagine some reasonably young companies in your industry that have relatively unoptimized business models that face similar issues. So we knew we needed to change our business model to something that had the potential to be great. That is, a business model that could scale alongside our paid marketing. 
So what did we do? In our case, we ditched the subscription model, and instead, or in, we ditched the subscription model, and instead we switched to a pay per introduction model. So under that model, a business had to pay to respond to each new customer that we brought them. And here's an illustration of how that worked. Say a business paid us $3 for each new customer that we brought to them, and say it cost us $2 to bring that customer to them. We could scale that all day long. And the more we scaled, the more money we made. So long as we could keep our marginal costs, including marketing costs, under $3 per lead, we could grow all day long. And we did. So this is a graph of monthly unique visitors to our site since 2009. And you can see there's like years here of wandering in the wilderness. And then we switched from a subscription model to a pay per introduction model, at which point SEM and other paid acquisition channels became available to us and we could scale rapidly in a, net, in a way that we never would have been able to when we were only on subscription. Since that time, we've been expanding our marketing to more and more channels and optimizing our business model behind the scenes to make us more and more competitive in those channels. So once you have a great business model, you're off to the races. The entire world of marketing is then open to you to the degree that your business model is competitive. And your success then depends almost entirely on your execution of the basics of digital marketing 101. Things like A-B testing images and ad text so that more people click on them. And making sure that the pages on which customers land when they hit your site are optimized for them to convert into paying customers. Again, this is the revenue world in which much of big e-commerce, mobile app installs, and lead gen live. And having a great and highly competitive business model is the holy grail of paid online advertising. If you have this, then you can start testing across all the different marketing channels. So long as you have a reasonably optimized funnel from impression to conversion, then there's likely going to be a good number of channels that work for you. So you can start with SEM or AdWords, and then work your way up the funnel. You can do retargeting, Facebook marketing, display ads, pre-roll video, online radio, the list goes on and will be specific to your industry. But if you can go out and bid for clicks or impressions higher than anyone else in the market and still make a profit, then you'll be able to outbid your competitors and own that category. If you monetize better than others on a per impression basis, you win. So to summarize, your success in digital marketing is not primarily dependent on things like how sophisticated your bidding strategy is in AdWords, or how well you A-B test images on your ads to get people to click on them. Although that work is very important, at the end of the day, digital marketing is really a business model competition, and your revenue model largely determines the marketing channels that are available to you, and the success that you'll have in them. So if you're early stage and you don't make money, you're reliant on free marketing channels, like SEO, content marketing, scrappiness. If your business model is good but not great, you may be able to make it work, but you still won't have, you'll still won't be able to win across the full suite of digital marketing channels. And if you have the best business model among your competitors, over the long term, you'll, you'll be able to win across the full suite of digital marketing channels. And the more likely you are to be able to outbid them and leverage all those channels, which will maybe one day allow you to reach a million users. So that's it. All right, questions? Yes? Did you use viral accelerators in your paid model? And if so, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, viral accelerators. So I would put viral accelerators straight into the, um, into the field of dreams bucket. Um, you know, vi so, they say that the best marketing is having a great product. And that is absolutely a given. And if you build a great product, then hopefully you can get some of that viral element. Um, and some products are built that are so great that they only need the viral element. Um, but uh, for us in the SMB world, there's never, well, somebody would sure will think of one, but I, don't, I can't think of an SMB focused company that has been built with viral marketing or viral elements. On top of paid. Yeah, I mean, so we do pay, and there's spillover effects because people like our product and come back um, again and again. 
Sure, and we're always trying to improve the product to make it happen more and more and more. But while that's all happening in the background, uh, we use paid marketing channels to accelerate that. Yeah? How do you think about lifetime value of customers? A lot of your stuff is per transaction. You have a lot of businesses where you might actually lose money on the first transaction, but you know you're going to keep the customer for a while, and actually you should lose money and should put that Totally. So I uh, oversimplified a bit, and you're absolutely right. Um, I would say that um, I would say that the, the companies in, in industries with the best LTV or the highest LTV can then go out and win these digital marketing channels. Um, so you don't necessarily have to make the most money on the first transaction, but if you're making the most money um, per customer over the long term or lifetime, then um, then you should be able to win those channels. And then that becomes a game of raising tons and tons and tons and tons of money so that then you can push the LTV out further and further and further. And then you go and pour money into these marketing channels, you lose money on like the first transaction, and then hopefully you make it up over time. So you're absolutely right, I over some fun. Yeah, in the back. Can you talk a little bit about how Yeah, getting the best revenue model. I mean, uh, that's that's that. Well, that varies dramatically by industry um, and company, of course. For us, there. Well, for us, it was like step plus iteration, step plus iteration. So it was free iterated. Well, on the non-business model, but on the product then. Step to subscription, which was a completely different type of uh, business model. We tried to iterate upon that. For example, we rolled out tiered subscriptions to try to um, optimize our pricing better, but even so, we found that that didn't work. And then we made this other step to this completely new revenue model, and we've been optimizing it repeatedly on top of that. Um, and so there's like two, there's, you can optimize the actual price that you're charging customers, which we do, and then you can also build the product behind the scenes to maximize the LTV and get people to come back more and more, which helps out on the back side. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you did much on uh, sort of own channels. How do you, how do, you do the cost benefit analysis of taking that on the back end and repackaging <coughs> the product you made earlier, the you know, existing relationships you have with the CRM or follow on things on your own site versus the site? It's very tough. Like every quarter we go through this strategic planning process where we're like, do we focus on external growth or do we focus on internal engagement basically? So it's like, do you go out and acquire new customers or do you try to retain the customers you already have better? Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a balance and a judgment call, you know, almost monthly for us where to put our design and engineering resources um, on that question. So. I think there's there's no, for us, it's almost like, okay, in either of those places, if we found something that hits, okay, we're gonna spend like the next six or eight weeks just like throwing all our resources into that and making that work, and then we'll step back once we've done that, and then, okay, what's next? Uh, yeah. No been over the course of many rounds of financing. So we did a uh, family and friends round of about uh, $500,000 in 2008, and then an angel round of 1.2 in um, 2010, and that's when we were on the free model. And then we tested subscriptions, and that worked only okay, and we went out to raise our A round and had like, real trouble raising it. We went to talk to like 60 VCs, and nobody wanted to give us money. Um, and uh, then we switched to the paper lead model as we thought that we might not get funding and we uh, might die. And so we were like, oh crap, we need to make money. Let's switch the revenue model. Um, and then we got money and then we've just been like iterating on that since then. All right, Victor, am I done? All right, thank you.
Thank you.